Ya Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, wherever you are, whenever you are, in any part of the world, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you, whether you are Muslim or non-Muslim, whether you are from the south or the north or east or the west, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shower his blessing upon all of you, inshallah. Two weeks ago, we talked about the negotiating process or negotiation during the peace agreement. Today, we are talking about What's after signing? What comes after the peace signing? And and today, I would like to acknowledge the thanks to uh, Ahmed Sheikh and uh, Sahar Amir who prepared the material, and Sahar and the Abdurrahman Nahas who prepared the media uh, presentation. If you want to join me, I've got, uh, this is my social media as well. Uh, if we are going to a peace process or a peace negotiation, we have to prepare three teams. One team should be involved in peace negotiation. Another team should be during the peace negotiation preparing the roadmap for what's after peace negotiation, signing. The third team will be able to execute the roadmap after peace negotiation is signed. Clear? Three teams. Two weeks ago we talked about the first team and its criteria. And each one of the three teams has got it is specification, its quality, its leadership to enable such a team to get the roadmap right during the peace negotiation so when the third team will be able to implement it after. So three teams. We talked about the first one two weeks ago. Introduction today, peace is the harmony. The, of harmony of, the harmony of human beings with each other. We have to live in harmony. Like when you go to a symphony, each musician who holding his instrument in his hand or her hand has to compose the music harmonically together. Okay? So harmony that we live in, with each other and building a strong social relationship away from what? From hatred, conflict, violence, fear. Where it caused a lot of what? All this conflict, hatred, violence, and fear. It caused what? A lot of bad social and psychological effects and led to the disintegration of our society and the desire of, for revenge and abuse. Of human rights are lost as well and society uh, lags behind progress and civilization and features of the futures disappear. So this is because of conflict, because of hatred, because of this integration of the society. Peace will wipe all these ills in the heart of the individuals and bring the harmony that we're talking about. What's our message of peace? Is to spread emotion among human beings and love and, and love, emotion and love, and erase the feeling of violence, hatred, conflicts, which occur between people. So it, it's like a doctor who has the medicine to treat me as a sick patient and bring my good character instead of the bad character that you have been experiencing. Three teams working for different processes of building peace and stability. One for negotiation, one to put the roadmap and one to implement and execute the roadmap afterwards. So we'll divide this stage into two parts. Steps during the peace negotiation and steps during, so after the peace negotiation, after the peace signing. That right? That right, Sahar? 
steps of preparing peace building before and during the peace negotiation. What are the steps? Number one, we need to know our human resources. We are a country with 100 million, with 50 million, with 1 million, with 500,000, whatever it is. We need to understand the sources of human resources, the quality of our human resources, which is the human resources in any country, which is our citizens, are the most valuable asset for any country. And when we invest in them, we get the highest reward. So we need to know our human resources and the community leaders. Who are the community leaders? Some community leaders used to be before the war. Some appeared during the war. Some will go after the peace. As we have seen in the Arab Spring in many Arab countries, a lot of so-called leaders fall during the rise of the Arab Spring. And new leaders came. And after the, uh, uh, what do you call it, the freezing of the Arab Spring, more leaders came again. So we need to know who is the leaders and who is the playmaker. Knowing the newly developed local culture, ideology, values, habits, that are affecting the local communities. During the conflict, like if, if I give the example of Yemen now, the example of Syria, the example of Rohingya, the example of Libya, the example of South Sudan and different countries, the fragmentation of societies and communities in different parts of any country will create a new culture and values of these clusters of people who are living together outside the normal country which was there before the conflict. So we have to understand the culture of the new clusters of citizens who are living together from different districts or different cities in one location. We need to understand community problems. What are the most important problems affecting? This is the roadmap because I want during this process to make the roadmap. Problems affecting uh, community and newly developed uh, ones during the uh, conflict. There's old problems and there are actually new problems happen during the conflict. We need to know the non-state actors, the people who are holding the guns in their hands. You see? The guns in their hands. Those are main players. Okay, who are they? Non-state actors, armed groups, and new community leadership. As I said, that community leaders will be changing. Okay? Because of the rise and the fall of the uh, traditional leaders, uh, uh, the previous traditional leaders. We need to know also the regional and the global power, which we talked about them in the last uh, week, uh, last uh, talk, affecting the process of peace negotiation. We need to know the ge geography and sources of the natural resources. Now we are in a country where we don't know the natural resources of our country. Oil, gas, gold, uranium, cobalt, uh, phosphate, and others. We need to know them. While people are making the peace negotiation, we need as well to understand the wealth of our country and to discover the wealth of our country. Okay? Because the wealth of any country belongs to every citizen. Belongs to every and each citizen. In my own view, how can we empower the citizens of one district? By telling them, protect your natural resources in your district. Invest in it, develop it, and share it with the rest of the districts, with the rest of the people in the country, with your fellow citizens. When people in one municipality or on districts will feel that the land underneath them their feet belongs to them, they will fight hard to bring peace to stability and to build peace. Knowing also the ability of a state institution, government organization, and civil society 
يعني when we are looking at the road map do we have a state institution do we have a stronger civil society sector do we have a stronger strong civil society organization or not because I am preparing the road map for what's after peace signing and number eight drawing the strategic road map for peace building after that when I know all this and the others I will make the road map for what's after this negotiation. Clear? One team to negotiate, one team to create the roadmap, and the third team will we'll talk about it after signing the peace agreement. This is the third team, which will be responsible for building the steps of building peace after signing the peace uh, agreement. Three teams, three teams, three teams, three teams. What is the mission of this team? First of all, to invest in building what? Local municipality. Extremely important because the local municipality and the local, uh, what do you call it? Uh, yes, municipality will be able to hold the infrastructure of the site of bottom up will be able to fill the gaps, the community gaps in different parts of the district level, on the town level, on the village level. Okay? Building the local municipalities and the state institution. Number two, investing in building capacity and capability of whom? Of human resources. As I, as I mentioned earlier, the most rewardable investment in any society is investing in human resources. We invest in agriculture sometimes, we invest in road industry, we invest in animal industry, well, livelihood, in, in livestock industry, we invest, invest in oil, in gas, all this fine. But investing in the human resources is more rewardable than investing in all of these, whether individually or collectively, and this is what I believe in. If we don't invest in the citizen, the rest will be wasted, and corruption will be a system in your country and in any other country. Okay. Number three, civil society sector and civil society organization. If you want to build stable peace, you have to widen the space of liberty of civil society sector. To enable the civil society to have more freedom and wider space of freedom and stronger independent civil society organization then can tackle the problem inside the society, on village level, town level, district level, and national level. We have to increase the size of civil liberty space and empower the civil society organization and ensure their independence. And they should be independent from governments, especially state institutions. State institutions should not be dictated by a president or a king or an emir or a prime minister or a minister or whatever it is. State institution is to guarantee the stability of the state independently from the policy of the government. Because sometimes the government overtake the direction and the control of the state institution and spoil the country and make a corruption as a system. And by the way, all what I mentioned, whether kings or emirs or sheikhs or president or queens or ministers are civil servants serving the citizen. They are paid by the tax, paid by the citizen to serve the citizen themselves. So they are civil servants. Number four, promoting community partnership. You see, partnership, cohesion, coalition, all this. 
This is something which I kept saying years and years and years. No one group, no one jamaat, no one political party, no one ethnic group, no one, uh, 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 what do you call it, religion, religious group, no one sectarian group will be able to build peace alone. We have to work together collectively in partnership to safeguard peace so we can build our own country and the future of our own generation to come. Building coalition between organizations and this will be a part of the culture. Nobody can do it alone. Ensuring wider civil liberty, I mentioned this before, and more freedom for whom? Media, drama, cinema, politicians to speak up, activists, human rights activists, all those, they should feel that they are free to, to, to air their views and nobody's going to imprison them, to capture them, detain them, or torture them, like what we see nowadays in many, many countries on earth, unfortunately. Clear, clear, this is, this is how to implement the roadmap after peace signing. Promoting community projects, very simple ones. We came out of war, maybe the economy is very weak. Community project, which means that we enable every family or every citizen to produce something and to produce it and sell it in the local market. To provide a space for each family, which we call it resilience to earn their living and to find their income on a daily basis. Now, don't rely only on businessmen, millionaires, multinational companies, because those people could quite often sign agreement with corrupt government or with a bad deep state organization to corrupt the country and steal its resources. And the most important example in front of all of us in the rich Africa. Rich Africa in, in, in Chad, in uh, 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 Congo, in Central African Republic, as well as others, in Niger, Nigeria and others. So make each citizen able to earn his or her income on a daily basis from small projects that they can actually run and do it. Promote the community projects that, okay, we mentioned this. Building community markets for everybody, space for them to sell and earn money. And this is how we can we build the economy bottom up. Bottom up, more important to stabilize the economy than top down from the great business. We might need the businessman, but when we have a stronger civil society organization and civil liberty and stronger in a state institution. Free movement of goods between districts, different districts, because in, in, with this kind of autocratic dictatorship regime, they don't allow the citizen to transfer product from district A to B to C to D. This district could be extremely rich, this district is extremely, extremely poor, because this has got resources, they don't have resources. We have to ensure the free movement of product and goods from a district to another district, from a town to another township, from a village to a village, and from uh, area to area. Promoting skills education, skills education, state education, traditional education, as well as others, vocational training. Because, because we need to, while we are promoting the state education, the traditional, which can take about 10, 15 years or more, we need people don't want to to, to, to carry on learning for 15 years. Young people would like to learn the skills and go out and earn their money. So we have to promote all this. Also investing in agriculture. Why agriculture and livestock? Because this is profession does not need a lot of qualification, does not need a lot of uh, uh, knowledge. It can accommodate the many of the people or the many of the citizens by providing them daily income as well. And providing them their daily income. 
youth, at least 50% from any country are youth. We have to empower them, not by using them on a stage, at a photograph, or as, a, as an image, but really, really, really to enable them to become decision maker, to enable them to become a part of the decision making process, to enable them to be learned and having the experience from the older generation who will be able to invest time, money, and resources to create the new leadership from among the youth. And allow them to work in government institution as well, an organization. Traditional education and other, I mentioned this before, we have to invest in the traditional education that we know and uh, uh, skills education, vocational training, community education. Community education is something to be produced uh, uh, pioneerly by the community itself, outside the closed rooms of the classroom. When we find that some children hate to be sitting in four in a room and they want to be learning under the tree or here or there, the subject that they like. And this could be developed by the local community who will know the culture of the local community, who will know the culture of the area and the ability of their children. Armed groups, we have to rehabilitate them. Then to engage them, then to bring them to uh, find a job for them in different uh, ministries, whether some of them would like to become a part of the security system, some of them would like to become part, uh, a part of the military, some of them would like to go for teaching, for agriculture, for business, for nursing, for all these kind of profession, we can actually rehabilitate all those armed groups. Otherwise, if we don't rehabilitate them and invest money and time and wealth in them, they will keep holding the guns in their hands. Promoting community cohesion and the conciliation of po our policies is to be for community cohesion and the conciliation. People might say, why what about uh, the law, the constitution? Yes, it should be on the agenda. It takes a longer time. What I'm talking about is something to start clicking from day one on the roadmap. During that, we have to put the law and the order in action, which takes time. To agree on a constitution, to agree on the law, and where we build the state institution. Keep building the state institution. In conclusion, the need to promote peace at all levels as sustainable development goal is a crucial opportunity to advance towards fundamental freedoms. Freedom is the cornerstone of sustainable peace. Freedom, accountability, to whom? A king should be accountable to the public. A queen should be accountable to the public. A prince should be accountable to the public. A sheikh should be accountable to the public. A president should be accountable to the public. A prime minister should be accountable to the public. A minister should be accountable to the public. All those people are civil servants serving every individual in the country. Accountable. Accountability, participation, and others. Freedom. Okay. Peace is not only the absence of violence or war, but peace includes respect of human rights, cooperation, equality, equality, and the promotion of sustainable development and human security. This is the peace that we want. So come back to conclude. So when we go to the negotiation process, we have three working groups. One group will be working for the negotiating process and they should be very skillful in the process of negotiation as we discussed it two weeks ago in negotiation or negation. This is number one. During the negotiation, we have to find another group to lay the roadmap of what will be happening after the peace negotiation. Then we have a third group 
to implement the roadmap as projects when we sign the peace agreement. Never ever wait till the peace agreement is signed, which might take about a year or six months or two years sometimes, and said, okay, let us sit down now to make a roadmap. No, 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 no. You should come out of the peace negotiation before signing with a roadmap and with a team who can implement the roadmap from day one. Thank you very much, everyone. And may Allah bless you. And Jazakumullah khair. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.